Okay, y'all. So welcome to our first true lab. Um, we're going to start talking to you this week in lab about anatomy. And so you've really carried on a discussion with Dr. Denniston based on confirmation. He's told you that he wants you to be familiar with some external anatomy and we keep talking about some bones, but really this lab's going to focus on just that, a lot of those bones, and hopefully making you more familiar, especially with forelimb and the hind limb uh, by the time we're done here today. So the first thing I want to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time up here in the classroom, even virtually. Uh, typically we'd have you sitting in the, the seats. Uh, our TAs are, are here with us today as well. Um, and so we're going to go through and talk a little bit upstairs here about types of bones or categories of bones and their respective functions. Uh, maybe list some examples of those. After that, we'll talk a little bit maybe about some tendons, ligaments, uh, and their role. Um, and then we've got a, a forelimb and a hind limb set aside over here that we'll pull up uh, and we'll actually go through uh, the skeletal anatomy on the forelimb and the hind limb. Make sure you guys are familiar with that. Uh, and then we're going to walk over to Legends Barn and we've laid out uh, a number of different individual bones for you guys. We have a whole horse skeleton over there uh, named Ike. Uh, and we'll go through that and show you a few things. Uh, and then at the end we'll pull out a, a live horse and kind of talk about some points of reference uh, and just general confirmation how they're put together. Um, and so hopefully with that uh, you guys can see and hear everything. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started with some types of bones. And the first thing, uh, I'll post some excerpts from the lab manual um, that you guys can kind of look at what they've had in years past, but the first thing to be asked would be how many bones are in the horse's body? And so hopefully in your head, you guys are answering these questions, but we've got 205 bones in the horse's body. Now, the first portion of that that we're going to discuss is the vertebrae or the vertebral column, okay? You guys are gonna to have to know the vertebral column, so we're gonna talk about this in much more detail and break that out, but there's 54 bones in the vertebral column, okay? And you guys will know where all of those uh, come from, okay? And so from there, basically we could go down the line and we could talk about ribs. How many ribs are there? 36, okay? And so when we talk about the vertebral column, we'll talk about 18 thoracic vertebrae. Well, there are 36 ribs, okay? How many sternums are you, do the horse have? One, okay? So that makes that pretty easy. Skull. So I'm gonna show you a skull today, more or less as just something that's pretty cool and something that you guys can visualize. It's not something you see very often with a horse's skull, um, but for this sake, or the, this course, in the sake of this class, uh, you guys do not need to know all the individual bones of the skull. When you take equine disease with Dr. Hess, I promise you she will make you know all the muscles and all the bones in the skull, uh, and you can learn that at that time. Um, but we'll leave this at 34 for today, okay? And so with that, it really just leaves the foreleg and the hind leg. And so we'll put them down here just to make sure you guys can see. And so hopefully again, you guys are taking notes and learning these. Foreleg and the hind leg both have 40, okay? And so if you add all of those up, you will get your 205 bones in the horse's body that we just discussed, okay? And so from here, now I really want to go over some categories of bones. We can talk about some examples uh, and then go over their primary function, okay? And that's something that you guys are going to have to be familiar with. Uh, even virtually on a lab midterm or a lab practical, I may show you a picture of a bone and I want to know type of bone and also its function uh, and the name of that bone, okay? And so the first ones that we could discuss and categorize, TAs can chime in or you guys can answer at home, um, would be a long bone, okay? And so these are those long cylinder-like bones, okay? Okay, what would be an example of a long bone? So you might list the canon, the femur, the tibia. These are all examples of long bones. And so if you had to guess what would be, those are all examples, what would be a function of the long bones, okay? You think about your legs as well and moving around. Truly, the function that we're going to describe for them is they act as, what? Levers and support, okay? Act as levers and support. So, 
those would be our first categories of bones with the long bones. The next one that we're going to mention would be the cuboidal bones, okay? Now, cuboidal bones, hopefully you're thinking tiny little cubes, right? And so where are the tiny little cubes on the horse's legs? And you oftentimes think knee, okay? And so if you're talking about these little cuboidal bones that make up the knee and the hock, what do you think would be the primary function of these cuboidal bones, okay? What do you think? When all of a sudden you land and you hit the ground, okay? Hopefully those cuboidal bones are what? Absorbing shock and concussion, okay? So, you know where those cuboidal bones are, and hopefully you know the function of them now. Next ones we could discuss would be flat bones, okay? Now, there's two separate kind of respective uh, functions that we're going to talk about, okay? Now, one example of a flat bone would be the scapula, and I'm going to talk about the function of that and surrounding that separately from some other flat bones that we may list and characterize. The scapula and the function of that as a flat bone really provides scaffolding or basically support for muscle attachment. And so when you look at the forelimb here shortly, it's not like the hind limb in the sense that there's a socket where the femur goes into the pelvis. You just have, and when we look at Ike and you see the whole horse skeleton, that scapula just looks like it's laying over top of the actual horse, okay? There's no socket. So you have this incredible mass of muscle and muscle attachment over the scapula that's attaching that forelimb to the actual horse, okay? And so that's our main function of that flat bone. And we'll talk about that scapula here when we look at a forelimb here in a minute. Um, beyond that, some other examples of those flat bones. These are, again, usually thin, flat bones. Other examples would be something like the pelvis. They could be something like the ribs. They could be a number of other things in the skull. Uh, and really, when you start talking about those other flat bones, what do you think would be the function of those? What's hidden behind all of those? Hopefully, they are protecting vital organs, okay? And so that could be a, a main function of those flat bones, okay? Uh, whether that was the brain with the skull or the heart and lungs with those ribs, um, reproductive organs inside the pelvis. Uh, and so there's a lot of other things that are being protected by uh, those flat bones, okay? The next category that we could mention would be pneumatic bones, okay? Now this is not something that is a, a very common one, uh, but it is worth mentioning when we go over categories of bones. If you guys have done anything with tools or in the shop or anything like that, you might hear the word pneumatic. Um, really, when we think of pneumatic, we think of air, okay? And so these are bones that contain air spaces, okay? And so examples of those would be the frontal and maxillary bones of the skull, and kind of they house those nasal passages right there. And so that would be the pneumatic bones. Again, we're not going to go into great detail on the skull beyond simply mentioning that here, uh, but I want you to be familiar with that. Two categories left. Next, we could talk about the sesamoid bones, okay? The sesamoid bones, okay? We've got the proximal sesamoid, the distal sesamoid. Uh, we could also lump the patella into that, okay? And so those would all be examples of sesamoid bones. If you had to guess, what would you say is the primary function of these? So they act as pulleys for tendons. And then in parentheses, we could say reduce friction, okay? So that would be the primary function of those sesamoid bones. And we'll point those out on both the forelimb and the hind limb shortly. Um, one thing, as I start mentioning some terminology here, as we're going over even this categories of bones and some examples, and you'll see on the forelimb and the hind limb here shortly, we just mentioned proximal, distal, directional terms, okay? And so that's something that you guys really need to familiarize yourself with. On Canvas, I've posted a number of handouts that show you various directional terms. You need to know the difference between medial and lateral, dorsal and ventral, proximal and distal, cranial and caudal. And so if you're not familiar with directional terms, now is a good time to review all of those, okay? Because they will be very, very important, okay? The last category of bone that we could discuss 
be irregular bones, okay? And these are bones that are oddly shaped, unpaired bones that really don't fit in with much else, okay? Uh, and so they're gonna be the coffin bone, the long pastern. Um, there's a number of others that we could come up with that would fit into those irregular bones. But we'll just say oddly shaped, unpaired. And so those are our main categories of bones that we want you guys to be familiar with, okay? And so with that, I'm just going to quickly erase this, and we'll go over the vertebral formula, talk about maybe the difference between some tendons and ligaments, and then we'll jump over and look at our forelimb and hind limb, okay? And so we don't need a whole lot of room here. We'll just leave it to this. And so you guys all need to be familiar with the vertebral formula. We told you there are 54 bones in the vertebrae, in the vertebral column, but you need to know where all those come from. And so when you're writing the vertebral formula, I just do a C first. If you want to spell it all out, you can, but that makes it the easiest. This stands for cervical, okay? How many bones are in the cervical column on the vertebrae? Hopefully you're saying seven, okay? Now, Dr. Denniston talked to you a little bit about the horse's neck and cervical vertebrae, okay? Having seven bones in the horse, how many does a human have? Also seven. How many does a giraffe have? Also seven, okay? Only thing that changes in that length of neck is the length of each cervical vertebrae. All of them still have seven cervical vertebrae, okay? And so moving on down the line, next we have our thoracic. How many thoracic vertebrae do we have? Well, up here I told you we had 36 ribs, and they're each attached to one of those thoracic vertebrae, so if you had to guess, you have 18 thoracic vertebrae, okay? Now, one thing, to, I don't care about notation when it comes down to writing the vertebral column or the vertebral formula. If you wanna write seven and then the subscript is C, 18 and the subscript of T, that's fine. Uh, it just comes down to uh, personal preference, okay? And so, as we move on down the line, um, here we can talk about lumbar, and so you'll see all of these when we go over Ike and that whole horse skeleton. So. L6, next we have S. S stands for either sacral or you could talk about the horse's sacrum, okay? If we look at the sacrum on Ike, truly it's fused together. Some people just refer to it as the sacrum. S5, and so I just know it steps down one, okay? And then two things you can refer to with the last part of the vertebral column, you can say either cosageal or you can say caudal. I don't care which one you use, okay? Cosageal or caudal, this is 15 to 21 with an average of 18. So if you add up all of these numbers right here, you should get your 54 vertebrae, okay? And so that's kind of the last thing that I want you guys to be familiar with and kind of just general bones, categories, uh, and such. And so with that, really before we go over to talking about the forelimb and the hind limb, I mentioned to you guys just a little bit about tendons and ligaments, okay? And we can always carry this on this discussion even more with lecture uh, or in more detail uh, at another time if you'd like. I can always put some resources on Canvas. But when we talk about tendons and ligaments, there's a few things that I want you to know now. Again, when you take disease, you're going to have to identify all of them, and that's great. Ligaments, ligaments connect what? Ligaments connect bone to bone, which tendons then connect muscle to bone, okay? And so hopefully you can find the difference between those. Also, when we talk about tendons, the other thing that I want you to realize is flexor tendons run down the back of your leg, extensor tendons run down the front of your leg, okay? And so when you think about that horse picking his leg up, okay, basically that's flexing those tendons. And so we're going to talk about the superficial flexor tendon and the deep digital flexor tendon. They aid in picking up that horse's leg, okay? We have the extensor tendons that run down the front of that horse's leg. And when it goes to extend its leg forward, those are the tendons that are being pulled to extend it, okay? And so flexor tendons down the backside, extensor tendons uh, down the front. The only other one that I want you to be familiar with, so there's three that I'd ask that you be familiar with in this class, just in the general terms of reference, and that would be, again, superficial flexor tendon and deep digital flexor tendon, and then also the suspensory ligament, okay? And that suspensory ligament is really serving as a, a catcher's mitt, if you will, over top of that horse's fetlock and keeping that from overextending, okay? And so, again, those are the three things that uh, we can discuss more. Um, and I'll try to find some handouts just to show you online of where those lie within the horse. 
um, but good for you to be able to, to go look up as well. So I think with that, uh, let's go ahead and hop over and we will look at our forelimb and hind limb and work through all those bones on each to make sure you're familiar with those. It's one thing to look at it on a handout, it's another thing when you see the actual bones that are from a horse, okay? And so let's hop over there. Okay y'all, so we've got a forelimb and a hind limb sitting here now, and I just want to go over this uh, from top to bottom. Again, it's different when you're looking at these bones that actually came out of a horse. Uh, oftentimes horses come in, uh, maybe they're put down for a reason, we've done necropsies on them, uh, and we're able to take those bones and use them for teaching purposes for you. And so very different to see this as compared to a handout or something in a textbook, okay? And so we'll work down the forelimb from top to bottom, just talking about a few things. Some have multiple terminologies that you could use. Uh, and then we'll talk about the hind limb. Um, I'll mention a, a couple handouts, uh, and then we'll walk over to the Legends Barn, and we will uh, go over a few things over there. And so the first thing to mention at the top of this uh, forelimb would be the scapula, okay? And so you all need to be familiar, this is the scapula. This would be that flat bone. Down the center of this, we have the scapular spine, or some people would call it the scapular ridge, spine of the scapula, whatever you want to refer to it as, okay? And so that scapula is basically dictating our angle of shoulder, okay? And so if you follow the spine of this scapula, that would be following the angle of the horse's shoulder. We come down below the scapula right here, and we have the what? The humerus, okay? Now, we talked about in lecture um, with Dr. Denison the first time, that the point of shoulder is actually a point on which bone? I hope you're saying humerus, okay? And so this is point of shoulder up here, okay? Point of shoulder is not a point on the scapula. Point of shoulder is a point on the humerus, okay? We could come down and this is the radius. This would be a long bone here. And then up here would be the ulna, okay? Now, point on the ulna is also what reference point? We can point this out on a live horse today as we walk around that. But the ulna and the point right here is also the point of elbow, okay? So we've got point of elbow. This ulna is fused to the radius right here, okay? And then we come down, and we're going to refer to this, you could say knee, um, but we're going to also refer to this as the carpus, okay? And this is made up of all of those little cuboidal bones that we just discussed in those types of bones. Now, one thing that I want you guys to be familiar with, and we're going to start talking about directional terminology now, is this bone that you see sticking off on the side right here, okay? Might be tough to visualize a little bit on the camera. We'll show you this downstairs as well, but this tiny little odd shaped bone, it's an irregular bone if we're categorizing it. This little unpaired bone is referred to as the accessory carpal bone, okay? Now the accessory carpal bone is always on the lateral aspect of the horse's leg. What's that mean? on the outside. And so if you looked at this whole horse's leg, you could look at the scapula and the spine and hopefully guess that this is a right leg, okay? But if I cut this off right here midway on the radius and I ask you, is it a right leg or a left leg? You can now look at the accessory carpal bone and tell me it's always on the lateral aspect and that also makes it a right leg, okay? We move down beyond that. We have this long bone that is the cannon bone. Now, this cannon bone is also referred to on the foreleg as the third metacarpal, okay? So you could say cannon or third metacarpal. Tough to see again with things on the camera. I'll spin this around, sitting on the back and me moving one around. Usually they're fused. We have two little splint bones, okay? Those splint bones would also be referred to as the second and fourth metacarpals on the foreleg, okay? You'll see the difference here in a moment on the hind. So, cannon bone or third metacarpal, split bones or second and fourth metacarpals. So we move down from here and let's talk about these two. These two little bones right here would be sesamoid bones. Now also in the back, we'll talk about it here momentarily, hiding way up under here is also a sesamoid bone. So the reason that we refer to this as more than just sesamoid bones is because we have multiple, okay? So these become the proximal sesamoids. Proximal sesamoids closer to the center of the horse's mass, okay? Proximal sesamoids, move down. This would be the long pastern, then the short pastern, and the coffin bone, okay? And so you can say long pastern, short pastern, coffin. You could say P1, P2, P3. Um, you could say proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, uh, distal phalanx. I don't care which ones you say, but you have to stay consistent in your terminology, okay? And so if this is P1, this is P3, okay? If this is long pastern, this is coffin bone. And so hopefully you get that right there, okay? If all of a sudden I give you a quiz or an exam and you call this long pastern, this middle phalanx, and this P3, 
Sorry, okay, it's wrong. You're reaching for answers to try to figure out what they are, okay? Um, now, back behind this short pastern and this coffin bone, again, probably not something you can easily see on video. Uh, I've pulled this leg back a little bit, but this bone sitting right here is the distal sesamoid. So if these are proximal, this is distal, further away from that center of mass, okay? Another name for that distal sesamoid would be the navicular bone, okay? And so you guys have likely heard of the navicular bone. And so that's the entire forelimb. You need to be familiar with everything we just went over, okay? And I'll talk about a little worksheet that can help you to be more familiar with that uh, kind of in the learning process. And so right now we've got a hind limb. And so just know that when I give you this handout that you're going to look at, the handout has one more bone at the top, okay? This is essentially missing the pelvis, right? And so we start at this big long bone that's massive right here, okay? This long bone is what? The femur, okay? Maybe you went out and gave your dog a femur bone to chew on or something, big old bone, okay? And so when we talk about how this varies from that forelimb, we talked about that forelimb and that muscle attachment over across the scap top of the scapula. This femur has the socket right here that goes into the pelvis. And so a little bit different attachment with this hind limb as compared to the forelimb. So we have femur that comes down to, this right here is what joint in the horse? This is the stifle joint in the horse, okay? And so the stifle joint in the horse is made up of the femur. This is the patella, and then this is the tibia, okay? And so the femur, patella, and tibia make up the stifle joint in the horse, okay? Now the patella is analogous to your kneecap, okay? But we don't call this the knee of the horse. We're just saying the patella, you have a patella, yours is in your knee. So the patella is analogous to your kneecap, but this is the stifle joint of the horse. So this is the tibia, and then this tiny little one right here is called the fibula. You can remember it however you want, you can laugh at me, but we oftentimes say tibia, tell a tiny little fib, this is the fibula, okay? Whatever you want to use to remember that is, is totally up to you, but tibia, tell a tiny little fib, fibula, okay? Now, we come down, this would be the tarsus, okay? And so on the forelimb, that was the carpus, this now is the tarsus. This back here would be point of hock, okay? And we don't need to talk about the calcaneus back here, but it is, again, point of hock. Now, the fun thing, Below tarsus right here, everything is exactly the same as you saw on the forelimb. And so this is still the canon, but what changes now, it is the third metatarsal. Whereas on the forelimb, it was also the canon, but it was the third metacarpal. So on the hind, canon or third metatarsal. These are still splint bones on the back, but if you had to guess, now they are, what? Second and fourth metatarsals, okay? Exactly the same from here on out. We refer to these as which sesamoid bones? Hopefully you're saying proximal sesamoids. Below this we have the long pastern, the short pastern, the coffin, and that tiny one hiding underneath is the distal sesamoid or the navicular. Okay? And so just like the forelimb, you need to be familiar with all of those bones. And so in doing so, I will post a worksheet on Canvas um, that basically goes over just that with the forelimb and the hind limb and it asks you to identify all of those. I'll post this blank, and I'll also eventually post it filled out. But I want you guys to, again, practice. You need to be very familiar with this and comfortable, okay? I would suggest, again, draw additional lines out, okay? This is for you to look at and study off of. There's nothing labeled accessory carpal bone, draw a line out, labeled accessory carpal. Don't just call this canon. On the forelimb, call it canon and third metacarpal, okay? Call these the distal or this, the distal sesamoid and the navicular bone. So be as detailed as you can. The other piece of this and the other side of this is talking about external anatomy of the horse, okay? This is something that Dr. Denniston said and I would agree that you need to be familiar with, but it's a little bit of a review, okay? And so when we talk about where's the Gaskin yesterday, this is where the Gaskin was, okay? And so make sure you work all the way around this horse and are familiar with external anatomy. There should be no bone names on this side. The only one that I would tell you can creep over to this side would be the cannon, okay? You could call this the cannon bone. You could also call this the cannon on the horse. Otherwise, there should be no bone names on this side, okay? I will also post this completely filled out so that you can study it and be familiar with external anatomy. But those are the two things that I want you to work on. At the bottom, ask you a little bit about the superficial flexor tendon, deep digital flexor tendon, and suspensory. Look them up, do a little research, and try to come to a consensus, and then I'll post some descriptions on those uh, as well. 
And so we're gonna go downstairs here momentarily and we're gonna go show you Ike, that whole horse skeleton, and a number of other bones that we've laid out individually just to make you a little more familiar with things, okay? Now, from there, once we finish up today um, and you guys watch this lab video afterwards, in addition to completing a little quiz, make sure you're up on the content and familiar with things, we've also got a lab assignment this week. And so our lab assignment this week is pertaining to anatomy, and I'll make sure this lab assignment goes up on Canvas and you'll have a week to complete that. Uh, and so make sure you do those two things, okay? And so with that, let's go walk downstairs and we'll go look at uh, some additional bones in the whole horse skeleton. Okay, y'all, so we've got a number of bones laid out here on the table that you guys can see. Uh, and so I just wanna go over some of the individual bones, okay? I want you guys to be familiar with things when they're not just in a picture or on an entire bony column, like you just saw with the forelimb and the hind limb. And so right here, first things first, you should be able to identify category of bone, okay? And so hopefully in your head, you're saying this is a long bone, okay? This is what? This is the femur, okay? So the largest long bone in the horse's body. And so this right here, femur. Now we go to a much smaller long bone and this would be what? The cannon bone, okay? And so we've got this small little cannon bone. Now on the back, we talked about this uh, upstairs. On the back, we've got two splint bones, okay? And so these splint bones, depending on, we can't tell from this right here, if this was a forelimb, this would be the canon or third metacarpal, and these splints would be the second and fourth metacarpals. If it's a hind limb, it'd be the canon or, or, or third metatarsal, and these would be the second and fourth metatarsals. But long bone, you guys need to be able to identify. The scapula, we talked about upstairs, okay? And so a couple things with this. This is a flat bone, right? Really important with that muscle attachment. When we go look at Ike and we look at that whole horse skeleton here momentarily, you'll understand that and how it attaches to the actual horse. The scapular spine right here, really following the angle of that horse's shoulder, okay? Um, and so one thing to keep in mind with the scapula. I've got a handful of different coffin bones that are sitting out right here, okay? Now, a couple things with these coffin bones, you can tell they're very, very porous in nature, okay? Um, to the underside right here, I'll show you in a minute, this is where the deep digital flexor tendon attaches. So this is known as P3 or the coffin bone. A couple of these have a little bit of what we would call side bone on them, okay? Uh, and just this ossification that you see uh, on both sides. We've got a couple proximal sesamoids. And so category of bone would be those sesamoid bones uh, you remember where they were laid out on that bony column. Again, they're acting as pulleys for those tendons to come over top of uh, and help reduce some of that friction. We've got a couple other kind of random bones laid out. If we looked at what's left here, this would be, if you had to guess, a what? A long pastern, okay? And so here we've got a long pastern. We've also got uh, a little bit uh, of ossification on it as well. And so in certain areas, we could have some ring bone with horses. This right here would be the patella. Again, analogous to your kneecap, but what joint is this part of in the horse? All my TAs are secretly yelling stifle, okay? Um, and so that would be our stifle. This would be a bone that's part of the tarsus on the hind limb of that horse. Um, and then we've got a splint bone, okay? On this cannon right here, you saw these splint bones fused, uh, but they will occasionally break off, or again, it takes them a while to fuse uh, as well. And so here we've got a big splint bone, much larger horse than you can see what this came from right here, okay? If you looked at those two side by side. Um, one of the last few things I'll show you over on this table would be this diagram. And so if you guys can see this, we've got not the entire, but partial uh, segment of the long pastern we have the short pastern and then the coffin bone, okay? This little cross section right here, this little guy was what? This was the distal sesamoid or the navicular bone, okay? We talk about that, again, pulleys for tendons to go across the top of, reduce friction, etc. This little area that you see right here and this tendon, this tendon is the deep digital flexor tendon, okay? Coming all the way across over the top of that navicular bone and it attaches to the bottom of that coffin bone right here, okay? When we talk about those flexor tendons aiding and flexing, picking up that horse's foot. So if you pulled that tendon, you'd imagine you're gonna start to see rotation with this hoof. It's in addition to the superficial flexor tendon and between those two, they're gonna flex and help pick up that horse's leg, okay? 
Last thing I'd show you here is just a hoof capsule. These are pretty cool. They're really tough to get off, but it's cool to kind of show you that as it stands alone. Later in the semester, we'll talk about hoof care, some basics, some hoof anatomy. Um, and inside this, you essentially have this little inner digitations, kind of like fingers set like this, the interlock um, between uh, essentially the sensitive lamina and non-sensitive lamina uh, in the horse's foot. And so really tough to get these hoof capsules off, but pretty cool to be able to visualize that uh, and see inside. And so with that, let's go hop over to one of the other tables and then we'll go over to Ike, the whole horse skeleton. Okay, everyone. So we're over here now. We've only got two items sitting at this table, but it's worth mentioning to them. I think it's pretty cool to still be able to show you the skull of a horse, um, not something that you see very often. Uh, and so again, you can take this, uh, again, you could look at teeth, uh, you could look at the incisors, orbits. We talked about these pneumatic bones of the nasal passage right here, these frontal maxillary bones, uh, again, contain uh, air spaces, uh, and you could see that right inside that skull, okay? Uh, and so it's, again, worth looking at and being able to visualize and see these skulls. When you take disease with Dr. Hess, she'll make you know the individual parts of it uh, in a lot more detail. Um, but again, cool to be able to visualize that. The last thing I wanted to show you here before we hop over to Ike the whole horse skeleton um, is this, okay? Now, I'm gonna rotate it around a little bit and I want you guys to start to tell me, even in your head or you can yell at the, the camera screen or anything else, um, is this a forelimb or a hind limb, okay? Well, these little cuboidal bones right here, hopefully you're saying are the carpus, okay? And then this little guy right here gives it away. And this is the accessory carpal bone, okay? And so the other thing that you need to be able to identify other than just forelimb or hind limb is, is this a right leg or a left leg? Well, you know what? We cut this off on the radius like I told you, okay? You can't see the scapula, there's no scapular ridge, and so no longer can we tell based on the scapula if it is a right leg or a left leg. And so if we look at this accessory carpal bone, it is always on, we said, the lateral aspect of the horse's leg. Medial is inside, lateral is outside, so that makes this a left leg, okay? And so you could go through and identify all the bones on this just the same as we did uh, upstairs in the classroom. Um, but again, we've cut it off on the radius, you got the accessory carpal, all those cuboidal bones, your cannon, splint bones, proximal sesamoids, long pastern, short pastern, our coffin, and then our little navicular or distal sesamoid. And so you guys need to be familiar with all of that whether it's on a diagram or actual bones, okay? And so let's take a little walk over to Ike and we'll show you kind of this whole horse skeleton. So everyone, we're over at Ike. This is our whole horse skeleton that's great for demonstrations and for you to be able to visualize the internal anatomy and the bones of the horse, especially as we talk about conformation, okay? And so you need to be able to understand and visualize where is point of shoulder, where is point of buttock, where is peak of the withers, um, and point of croup, etc. And so I just want to show you and point out a few things on Ike as our whole horse skeleton um, and hopefully go uh, from there and we'll look at a live horse. And so we've got our skull. We just talked about that skull over there. This leads into our cervical vertebrae, okay? We said we have how many cervical vertebrae? Seven, okay? Same as you as a human, same as a giraffe. The only thing that changes is the length of each of these cervical vertebrae, okay? So our cervical vertebrae lead into which part of our vertebral column? The thoracic vertebrae, okay? So a couple of things to note with the thoracic vertebrae. You can see coming off of each one of these thoracic vertebrae is a rib, okay? And so you've got 36 ribs because you have 18 thoracic vertebrae, okay? The other two key things to point out with the thoracic vertebrae is the first 10 thoracic vertebrae make up the withers, and then the peak of the withers is T3, T4, T5. It varies a little bit from horse to horse. So this would be one, two, three, four, five. You can tell with this horse, somewhere in four to five kind of makes up the peak of the withers, but somewhere between three, four, five is, is pretty much common for most horses. And so that's peak of the withers, first 10 make up the entire withers. Once you move beyond the thoracic vertebrae, you can see where the ribs end, we have our what? Our lumbar vertebrae, okay? We move past the lumbar and we talked about the sacral vertebrae or the sacrum, and that's because if you can tell in video, all of these are essentially fused right here into the sacrum. 
Now, after the sacral vertebrae or the sacrum, we have the cosagil or caudal vertebrae. You can see all these little individual pieces. Now, we said this would be 15 to 21 or 18 on average. Um, it is really tough. You can see how small these get here at the, the end. And so it's really tough to get all of those out. Um, but generally, again, 15 to, to 21, 18 on average. A couple other things to point out. We've got the pelvis right here. And so you didn't see that upstairs. And you can see how the femur attaches to the pelvis. You see this socket right here, okay? And so we'll go compare that to the forelimb uh, on Ike here in a moment. But you can see this socket attachment of the hind limb. A couple things to remember that are key, okay? So patella right here, this is what joint? This is the stifle joint of the horse. We move on down. And so this was the tibia. So stifle joint, femur, patella, and tibia make it up. Tiny little fib, this is our fibula. This is what? This is point of hock, okay? Uh, and so this would be the tarsus, this would be point of hock. Uh, we oftentimes refer to it as the hock joint as well. And so when we're looking at a horse, if we need to palpate and you're looking at point of reference and you're gonna drop a line, point of buttock, this right here would be point of buttock, okay? We could come up and we would see point of croup at the top. We would see peak of withers with points of reference. Now we're looking at the forelimb again. This right here would be what? Point of shoulder, okay? Point of shoulder is a point on what bone? I hope you're saying the humerus, not the scapula, okay? Point of shoulder is a point on the humerus. And so we can see that and visualize that. We can palpate that on a horse, find the point of shoulder, and then running up this scapular ridge right here, this dictates our angle of shoulder, okay? And so when we kind of look peak of the withers to point of shoulder, we can follow that scapular spine, and that is the angle of that horse's shoulder. We're going to talk uh, about that more, okay? Uh, and so that's absolutely related to the length of stride in that horse. You have a horse that has a very upright shoulder, they have really short, choppy stride, okay? really long laid back shoulder, they have great length of stride to them, okay? And so that's what we're talking about with that angle of shoulder. Now, we talked about this scapula being a flat bone. You saw that individually here a moment ago, but we said it's not the same attachment as the hind limb, okay? There's no bony socket, like where the femur attaches to the pelvis, okay? This scapula looks like it's just laying over top of the ribs, okay? And that's where we talk about that flat bone and really it providing scaffolding, if you will, for that muscle attachment. We have tons of mass of muscle coming over top of this scapula to attach it to the actual horse. And that's how that forelimb uh, is attached. Moving on down again, the only other point of reference that I'll mention up here would be on the ulna right here. And this would be point of elbow, okay? And so other than that, I think it's just cool to visualize the entire whole horse and Ike. Um, any other questions that you guys have on that, uh, feel free to let me know. Again, I'll give you those handouts and those worksheets to go through. I especially want you to be familiar with terminology on the forelimb and the hind limb, but it is nice to be able to visualize the entire cervical vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, sacral vertebrae, um, the lumbar is sitting in between here, uh, etc. Okay? And so I do want you to be familiar with all of those, the categories of bone that you might see, uh, etc. And so with that, uh, we're going to go pull out a live horse. We'll talk about maybe those points of reference and finding them on that live horse, that point of shoulder, peak of the withers, point of buttock, uh, point of elbow, et cetera. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about how that horse is put together. Okay, so let's go walk outside and look at a horse. Okay, y'all. So we're standing outside here and uh, we've got a horse to just to show you a few things on. Uh, and I want to point out those points of reference that we just looked at on Ike, our whole horse skeleton point them out on our live horse, then we'll just kind of generally talk about a few things on how this horse is put together, okay? And so, a couple of things right off the bat when we talk points of reference, point of shoulder, okay? Point of shoulder is a point on the humerus, okay? And so we should be able to palpate that and feel that, okay? We come up and basically find peak of the withers, we draw our line right here, and this would be angle of shoulder. Right here I can feel that scapular spine, or the ridge of the scapula, okay? And so we can see angle of shoulder. It's not horrible in this horse, but it's not extremely well laid back. Uh, and so if, again, if you look at and visualize this angle of shoulder, generally we want that 45 degrees, 50 degrees, somewhere in there. And so it's a hair upright, but again, we definitely have seen way worse. We look at this horse's head and neck, uh, not entirely refined in the throat latch, big cresty neck, ties in pretty high, um, medium pronounced withers. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit. In terms of other points of reference, so we'll just push in some of this fat right here so we can see. Right here we have our point of elbow. 
this would be the ulna, okay? And so that's one of those reference points that we just discussed, okay? This is point of the elbow on the ulna right here, okay? We're coming back down the horse. This would be point of croup in terms of reference point. This would be peak of the withers, okay? We were looking at that, and ideally we want that horse to sit pretty level, okay? This horse is not horrible uh, when you look at it from a distance here, uh, but point of the croup, peak of the withers, we could also drop a line from point of buttock, and so you guys saw that on the pelvis when we looked at Ike here a little bit ago. So we could drop a line from point of buttock. Again, when the horse is truly standing up under himself, to get him to stand up sometimes, standing under themselves, uh, not quite like she is at the moment, but if we drop a line, this line should come down, intersect the point of hock that we see right here, go straight down the back of the cannon all the way to the ground. If they're tucked under, they're a little bit sickle hocked. Now you look at this horse, it's okay to be a little bit cow hocked. When they come up and move, they're just gonna clear their barrel a little bit, okay? But I want you guys to understand these points of reference. Point of buttock that you have back here, point of hock, um, this right here being the stifle joint. Um, point of the croup, peak of the croup, uh, peak of the withers, point of elbow, point of shoulder, uh, and so on. And so, other than that, we could evaluate, if you look around uh, to the front a little bit, uh, we'll move out of the way uh, here in a moment, and you could see uh, confirmation of the front feet. Horse toes in a little bit. Um, in terms of the rest on how this horse is put together, uh, again, we could kind of divide it into thirds a little bit. Uh, in class, we've talked about length of back. A uh, horse that is long in the back is long in the loin, uh, short in the back, short in the loin. We want them to be short, to be very strong and supple, uh, have a lot of impulsion, a lot of drive. Um, and, and again, we could start to walk all the way around the horse and evaluate them. And so when you guys are doing that for any confirmation class, uh, or just to me as a prospective horse that you're going to buy. You know, I want you to walk all the way around the horse and view them from behind, also view them from the front, uh, etc. okay? And so we'll do just a, a quick walk all the way around this horse so that you guys can see how they're put together. Um, but again, hopefully show you a little more points of uh, reference. And so we'll, we'll walk you around. Again, not the prettiest horse that we've, we've got. You can see they tow in quite a bit, okay? And so when we've got this horse that is pigeon-toed, like this horse is, if you look at this horse, and you look at my feet, and you see pigeon-toed like this, what happens when they walk? They wing out, okay? And so they can't help but wing out. When we talk about the opposite of this, it is splay-footed, and you're gonna have a horse that's going to wing in. Wing in and splay-footed is actually worse because you worry about them interfering with themselves, but we do have a horse that toes in quite a bit. Um, at the moment, standing, standing a little bit uh, base and arrow as well. Um, but I want you to start to look at how a horse is put together as a whole. If you're really interested in confirmation and anatomy, um, then again, you can take our confirmation class uh, and that leads into the horse judging team, okay? Uh, and so that's something that I want you guys to keep in mind. And so with that, hopefully today, you guys are a bit more familiar with anatomy and bone. The types of bones, categories of bones, the function of them, uh, the forelimb and the hind limb, you have to be very familiar with. Uh, we talked about Ike, those points of reference, uh, and then looked a little bit at this, uh, this live horse that we've got. Uh, and so I, I wish we could have you out here at the Equine Center, but hopefully with all of that you're a bit more familiar with the anatomy and the behind the scenes and the internal structures when we've discussed confirmation in class. And so with that, uh, again, we'll post that lab assignment on Canvas and let us know, either myself or the lab TAs, uh, if you guys have any questions. Thanks.